So welcome back to the Evolving Warfighter. My name is Dr. Franklin Annis, and today we're going to be talking about military anthropology. And I'm lucky enough to have a special guest with me today, uh, Dr. Heather Scottsgard, hails from the Australian Defense College, where she's a research fellow for cross-cultural development. She received her PhD in anthropology from the Australian National University. She is currently a visiting fellow at the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom and researches best practices in cross-cultural leadership. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my official first podcast interview, so be nice to me. <laughs> I, I, I promise to be nice. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're going to jump right in today, and I know that we bumped into each other on Twitter several months mm. ago, and the first thing I noticed about your bio is said that you were a military anthropologist, which caused me to reach out and ask one yeah. question. Is there such a thing as an academic field of military anthropology, or are you an anthropologist that works for the military, or why do you use this title, and does the field exist? Or have I just made the whole thing up because it sounds fantastic? Well, it does. Maybe a <laughs> oh, I guess it's, I, I really like the idea of starting with this question because it's, it kind of gives me a historical lever in as to how I got into anthropology. Um, I was doing my anthro PhD uh, at the Australian National University back in around 2010 when I saw this advertisement come around saying that they were looking for that the Australian Department of Defence was looking to hire an anthropologist, and I remember thinking sounds really interesting, but what on earth would an anthropologist have to do to contribute something of value to the Department of Defence? It just, it seemed to me like a bit of an oxymoron, the idea that military and anthropology would work together. It never occurred to me. Um, I now realise that's because I had what I now call sort of the, the brown men in grass skirts version of culture in mind. And I only thought that anthropology and culture kind of lived in these foreign distant lands of exotic people and well if we're not trying to sort of conquer them in war then what would an anthropologist have to offer to that? Uh, happily I moved on from that stage of my uncertainty. My husband was in uh, the Royal Australian Navy and still is and so I sent him the, the email and said do you have any idea what, what an anthropologist might do and of course as it happened the, the position was classified so even if he did know anything about it he wouldn't have been able to tell me. But he very cleverly said, well, the only way to really find out is to apply for the job. And so I thought, okay, fair enough. Um, so the job title was Senior Anthropologist at the Australian Department of Defence. And um, so I knew that there was like a military element and an anthropological element there. And the job description was suitably vague, so I didn't quite know what I was supposed to contribute. I think, honestly, once I arrived in the position, I realised they perhaps didn't quite know what I was going to contribute either but that they had a, a sense that there was a, a need for this within the Australian Department of Defence, at least. And so I did my, my research fairly rapidly um, in the, the process of, of the job interview experience, etc., and discovered that, um, that, that there are a variety of different ways in which the military have, have worked with anthropologists and vice versa, and we can get into that later. But the, the concept of an anthropologist working in born through the military kind of has three main categories that we can think of. We can think of an anthropologist studying the military and studying military culture, maybe as an outsider, maybe as somebody who was coming in from academia to, to study the military. And when my um, husband's Navy colleagues found out that his wife was doing an anthropological degree, they all assumed, well, she must be doing it on, on us because, you know, we're clearly a bunch of weird people, so we should have an anthropologist study us. I quickly said in response to that that I don't think it's a good idea to mess in your own backyard. So to start with, I thought let's just learn the new environment called the military and then we'll get towards understanding the anthropological dimension. But then when uh, this job came along, I then realised, well, there's a role for anthropologists working in the military, so not just studying the military but being within the military organisation, either in uniform or, or civilian. Uh, and with that, it's more a matter of then applying the anthropological skill set, the anthropological perspective to the sorts of issues and, and challenges that militaries face. And then thirdly, we've got anthropologists working as military, working to further national security objectives from within the military. And that's sort of the, the kind of classic 
idea that we now have as anthropologists in uniform. So there's sort of three categories, yeah, studying the military, work within the military, and then an applied application of anthropological knowledge to enhance national security objectives. To be honest, though, I think it's all, it's all names, it's all nomenclature. And really, any profession is only as, um, only as real as the people that say it exists. So uh, I was really delighted, actually, when uh, Montgomery McFate wrote a book and, and had it published last year called uh, Military Anthropology, and I've got it here. I don't know if you can see it there, Military Anthropology, Soldiers, Scholars and Subjects at the Margins of Empire. And when I saw that, I went, fantastic, I haven't made this up. It really does exist. But again, there's a party of two who agree to this at the moment, so we'll have to wait and see whether the rest of the crowd agree. We'll go ahead and move on to the next question. I know anthropology captures kind of a lot of other kind of subfields, or I don't want to say subfields, other fields when you study a culture. So that would include their political system, cultural practice, economic systems, really how people interact with each other on a cultural level. How is this type of study? of a culture, how is it beneficial for a military to have a, an understanding of a foreign culture or how they interact inside that foreign culture as they go mm -hmm. places? So I think here what we're talking about is um, perhaps mostly the second type of military anthropology that I spoke about before. So the anthropological study or an anthropological skill set being applied for the military, um, but not being applied anthropological. When it comes to, to the sort of themes that one might use within an anthropological skill set towards a military objective, but it really, it, it comes down, if you think about a definition of anthropology, it's how does an organisation, a social group, a nation perhaps, form an understanding of who it is and, and where it fits in the world? How does it come together to, to form shared values, to negotiate those values, uh, to identify where those values sit alongside other uh, social groups and their value systems. There's, there's some fairly standard, there's quite a lot of um, rubrics out there or dimensions of culture. Um, the Marine Corps, of course, have their five cultural dimensions. You can apply any set of, sort of acronyms um, to, to identify a, a framework for thinking through the impact of culture on military issues. But for me, there's, there's some fairly consistent ones that come up in, in my work. One of the main ones is just identity and thinking through identity at both an individual level as well as at a, at a national um, and organisational level. So when I'm trying to understand uh, a new uh, military organisation that perhaps we're, we're wanting to engage with or perhaps we're trying to understand how they make decisions, I, I want to understand who they are. How, how do they see themselves? You know, go to YouTube and, and Google National Day parades and, and see the sort of the symbolism that represents um, represents who they are as a people. Look at things like the, the language that they use. And there's a really interesting series about to come out from US Air Force, Center for Language and Culture, on Air Force language use and, and how that reinforces uh, a sense of belonging and a sense of being a part of a team, but also how it then creates a sense of distinction, a sense of difference. So then I look at uh, things like worldview, you know, what are the, what are the key values of, of the group and society? How, what, what does a good leader look like within the organisation? And we can apply all of this to ourselves uh, and our own military organisations in the first instance in order to really understand our own culture and culture position, thinking through what forms of power leaders are expected to, to be able to, to build, maintain, effectively employ, and then how are those power structures perhaps negotiated, sometimes pushed back against by subordinates or by other um, figures within the, the field of power. How do those um, negotiations of power play out? Uh, and what do we need to understand about how that impacts decision making? And then even just when it comes to the field of decision making, yeah, um, how do decisions get made within the organisation? Is it a sort of a, a top down, bottom up, a negotiated process, a bureaucratic process? All of these give us an idea of how the, the key values um, that shape the, the organisation and the motivations that they have. 
And then there's the, the very practical dimensions as well, which is you know, how, how do you show respect within this culture? Oftentimes when I, I used to, in the early stages of de delivering um, cross-cultural education to, to soldiers before going out on deployment, for instance, or going into defence attaché roles, the very common question that would come up would be, well, don't we just have to treat them with respect? And so I'd say, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so talk me through. What does, what does that look like? You know, what, what is respect uh, to you? And oh, well, you know, clear eye contact, firm handshake, um, make sure you're not wearing your sunglasses. Most people at least seem to recognise that. But then from the anthropological perspective and from the cross-cultural dimension, we do know that um, a firm handshake and, and firm eye contact can be quite alienating in some, in some cultures. So it's just about being essentially a mirror back to individuals who are starting to try and think through how they should best build relationships with their, their counterparts and helping them to recognise that what we take for granted as being normal and, and you know, right is not necessarily going to be useful for engaging with their, their counterparts. There are quite a few different elements there. Um, I think, I, well, at the end of uh, the High Line Staff College training that I was delivering this year, I had a, they asked me to sort of wrap it up with a sense of what are some, some key anthropological concepts that uh, they, that I thought they needed to know in order to take into their next role. And the problem is, I think oftentimes anthropology sounds like this sort of obscure, complex discipline that you need to know some really in-depth theoretical concepts to be able to navigate. Um, but for me, if I've, if I've only got sort of 15 minutes with people and I, I need to bring through three what we might call loosely anthropological concepts, it is that you know, identity in the first instance of how people form identity, what symbols they use to represent themselves and how they negotiate that identity alongside others. How then the second dimension is, is boundaries. We are only that which we are not. We define ourselves by that which we are not. So how does an understanding of who Heather is not help me understand who Heather is? How do we take an understanding of the distinctions that people make in society, the, the boundaries, the, the categories, the boxes that we put ourselves in? We do that through understanding the boxes that we exclude ourselves from. Uh, and it can be something as simple as you know, day and night or inside and outside. Um, the classic anthropological theories um, and research uh, focused on, on things like the the household mapping to try and understand sort of who was in what family and who was out of what family, how the, the makeup of the village was, was established and they do these little mud maps to identify the men's quarters and the women's quarters. I think these tell us about as much about ourselves and the lenses we're using to think about the field as they do about the field itself. But those distinctions and, and those boundaries are quite key to helping us understand what uh, the values are that are driving the behaviour. And then last, the third dimension that I always um, draw out is power, and looking at the very various ways in which power can be formed, and particularly speaking to a military audience, we have a tendency to see power very much as a sort of a, a, a unidirectional trajectory. The employment of power, of force against a military target. And so what I then seek to do is unpack the multiple different dimensions of power that that sit alongside that, that military dimension of uh, employed force and the multiple ways in which power is always negotiated and contested. So then thinking through things like the various forms of, of capital that an individual or an organisation can employ in order to achieve their objectives in a way other than force, because force is just one form, one currency in the, the negotiation of goals. And that might be um, you know, sort of personality, it might be charismatic, it might be subcultural capital, it might be literally economic capital, uh, it might be social capital, the, the people that you know and the connections that you can build on and draw on. But there's a whole range of different value systems or currencies that we draw on when we're trying to negotiate systems of power. And these are always in contest. So to understand what capital an organisation or an individual is bringing to a game and then how they're 
competing against others in that game is quite a useful way of understanding the power dynamics within the organization or subculture. The, yeah, I guess there's a lot of useful information there. Reminds me of, like one of my experiences in Iraq dealing with uh, high ranking high ranking Iraqi officers. We were told that the, their military valued kind of knowledge more than honesty in some some regard. So if you ask an officer in front of a whole bunch of soldiers a question, he's going to give you an answer, whether that answer is correct or not correct, because it was perceived that their officers always had knew what was going on. So if we were in a situation where we needed an honest answer from a, from a high ranking officer, we had to make sure like, hey, we take him aside, take him outside away from anyone else and ask them the question because one on one, they might individually say, well, we don't know or give us an entirely different answer. But yep. a lot to that, that whole concept of power and perception and kind of identity um, shaping actions, so. Yeah, and this is one of the challenges, I think, is that we tend to very often fall into, you know, we, we read other people's behavior through our own lenses. And, and so what we tend to do is we jump straight to, oh, well, you know, they're un <laughs> somebody who doesn't just tell you what it is, you know, like it is must be untrustworthy or must be dishonest. And I think what it reflects is our inability to see what the reality actually is for them. So when they're telling it like it is, they're telling it like they need it to be in order to continue to be a part of a meaningful social structure and to continue to, to be able to exert their agency and achieve their goals within that meaningful social structure. Uh, but we, we too often fall straight into that, oh, it's all lies or it's all corruption or it's all, you know, these these bad things that live in other places, you know, that, that of course we wouldn't do. Um, but I think that shows more about us, perhaps, than about our um, actual understanding of the reality. Probably very true. <laughs> How long has anthropology been connected with uh, warfare? Is this kind of a new concept that's happened recently, or is there historical uses of anthropology? Well, I'd like to say that anthropology just started when I found out about it in about 2010, because I felt a bit daft that it existed and I had no idea. I think, to be honest, I think the what I would call the anthropological use of, of knowledge to achieve military effects existed long before anthropology existed, uh, long before the discipline of anthropology would have been recognised. Um, we've got the Athenian general, uh, Thucydides. He was studying Spartan culture, basically, in order to understand the Spartan worldview and, and value system. That was back in, I think, 400 BC or thereabouts. Very, very long time before we had anthropology. But the, the recognition, I mean, Sun Tzu's um, enjoyed the to, to know thyself. Um, the recognition that we need to know ourselves and know our, our counterparts in order to be able to achieve uh, military effect is, is quite a, an ongoing um, recognised priority. But in terms of then how anthropologists themselves have been used in the, sort of the modern military enterprise, We've got, right back to the, the colonial heritage of anthropology, anthropology is called the handmaiden of colonialism because it essentially was invented as a, a tool of, of the colonial uh, enterprise. We recognise, also the, the colonial nation, recognised that they needed to understand how local systems worked in order to be able to effectively govern either locally or at a distance, uh, remote dominant structures. So the, the very earlier stages of um, our you know, diplomatic posts around the world uh, were quite often uh, informed by anthropologists, or I mean, P. Lawrence was an, yeah. an archaeologist who was a, a branch of, of anthropology. So we, we've got the likes of T. Lawrence, um, you know, back in the day helping to understand the Arab uprising. Uh, it's actually more recently than I started to think, because I really need to look into this. Um, I'm writing a paper on it for one of my uh, Australian roles. And uh, it was there that I discovered that, uh, well, I mean, I, re I already knew about Ruth Benedict. Uh, she wrote The Chrysanthemum and the Sword back 
for it was the US Office of um, hang on, the War Information, Office of War Information, trying to understand um, the Japanese mindset, the, the Japanese worldview, and uh, how American troops needed to, to prepare for, understand, and, and navigate uh, that, that climate. Uh, it turns out that many people still today see a lot of value in what she wrote. But she would have been perhaps the first, you might call, um, anthropological intelligence analyst. You know, she sat behind a desk, essentially, um, and spoke to a bunch of, of, of Japanese expats uh, in order to try and understand uh, Japanese culture. But she was employing the anthropological mindset, the anthropological worldview to do that. In fact, I then discovered with my research that by the end of World War II, more than half of the anthropologists in the US were working for the government in one way or another, uh, were, were supporting the, the, the military effect. And that includes the number of the most famous names in anthropology. Uh, but of course, that was in an era when, we, when anthropology saw itself in a much more applied kind of a way. It was in the lead up to Vietnam and to the, the war in Vietnam itself that the anthropological um, community decided it needed to start to separate itself out and, and didn't want to be seen perhaps as the handmaiden of colonialism anymore. But there was um, quite the, the debate within anthropological societies around the world, but particularly in the US, about the role that they should play. And I can tell you more about that later if you like. But then more recently, uh, we've then got uh, the, the human train system, which um, I imagine you've heard of perhaps uh, with accolades or perhaps with controversies. And so that was back in, the, in 2006, I think, that the US Army established this human train system. And at its peak had, I think, over 30 human train teams actively deployed, a mixture of civilian and uniform individuals uh, who were seeking to kind of fill the gap, uh, the, the gap required for understanding um, social cultural knowledge in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was considered to be a, a very successful program, program by quite a lot of commanders, uh, military officers, um, uh, but then it also met with, with a fair degree of controversy. Um, so by the time I came along to uh, military anthropology, it was in its final sort of stages and it was disbanded around 2014. So um, it's not something I've had the opportunity to work directly with. But as you can see, it's, it's having talked about those sort of three dimensions of what military anthropology is. We've had studies of military culture. We've had studies within the military of other cultures. And then we've had the applied uh, dimension of applied anthropology. And it strikes me we're kind of swinging back into the studies of other cultures to support military uh, effect uh, and a little less of the applied anthropology, but watch this space. Who knows what will happen next? I do know that in the U.S. kind of, uh, or in the U.S. academia community, there was kind of a very significant uproar in terms of applied anthropology by those those specific teams uh, mm. to the level of you know people wanting to strip academic degrees and such uh, yeah. basically outlaw it because they they saw it as the use of cultural knowledge to manipulate other cultures or mm. to find an easier way to lie there's always kind of that that well just by the nature of war we're one country fights with another country to assert political will. So, at what type, at what point does it become manipulation versus trying to assert actions on a different culture? So, there's always that mm -hmm. kind of that negative type of violence. But I wanted to know your thoughts and if that is still an issue, or is it possible to have a type of in uniform anthropologist that would not be offensive to the academic community? Interesting. Okay. So an anthropologist who wears uniform and conducts anthropological research or anthropological, uh, sorry, uh, desk-driven research or, or fieldwork research? Field research. Yeah. I think this is where the challenge comes in, is that, I mean, 
there is no such thing, first of all, as an anthropological statement on, on any of these. There is the uh, American Anthropological Association statement in 2007, I think it was, where they uh, expressed their you know, serious concern about the ethical dimensions of uh, applied anthropology within a military environment. But having said that, they represent the American Anthropological Association, not the Global Anthropological Association. So you go to the UK and you see a different employment of anthropologists in, in the military. You go to um, well, Australia and there's one. You go to, say, France and Germany and you see uh, a different perspective again. There is increasingly the role of anthropologists working in professional military education institutions like what I'm doing now. And that, I think, is, is trying to teach sort of a culturally, not just culturally aware, but culturally attuned uh, officer and soldier you know, how to, to operate and, and, um, and negotiate the, the military requirements. But as to putting a military member in uniform, or sorry, as to putting an anth anthropologist in uniform or having a military member who's got an anthropological degree. I do know that there's, there are plenty of military officers who have anthropological degrees, but again, it depends on, you know, sort of, what is it, Groucho Marx who said that um, any club that wants me, I don't want to be a yeah. part of. I, I imagine that quite a few anthropologists have decided, well, I have an anthropological degree. That doesn't mean I need to not assume the identity of an anthropologist, and I will just employ my my skill sets as a military officer. If you were to be doing applied anthropological research, a field work, a lot of anthropologists would, would be concerned about the, the notion of voluntary consent, like psychologists as well. Um, there's, a, there's a dimension that uh, in order to maintain sort of ethical standards of research, the participants in any research project need to have uh, the ability to make both voluntary and informed consent towards the participating in the research project. And that was one of the concerns that came up under the human training system, was to what extent can you really voluntarily agree to share knowledge about your, your local household needs and the local community if you've got somebody you know, in a uniform alongside people who are carrying weapons and for all intents and purposes you look like a military force. How many people will go, oh, well, actually, I'm really rather not chat today. So there, there's that dimension to it. But those anthropologists who are contributing their, their expertise towards understanding military issues, there's also the concern there that the old adage, do no harm, first do no harm, whilst that's um, not necessarily a comprehensively signed on to anthropological principle, it is... It's, broadly accepted. But I'm more in the, the camp of the Margaret Mead um, back in the Vietnam War era and now um, Montgomery and McFaith, who both say that you can throw stones from the outside and have some, probably little, effect. Or you can get on the inside and have a much better chance of actually shaping military operations, uh, military decision making, uh, military you know, values towards uh, something that you consider to be a, a worthwhile goal. So I am, am delighted to call myself a military anthropologist and don't feel that there is an ethical uh, challenge to the work that I do, but ultimately it is up to each individual as to how they see that. Yeah, the, does that answer your yes, question? Yes, it does actually quite well. And I, I guess I, up until this point I never even had considered the whole issue of voluntary consent and it's not like you could opt out of not being having intelligence yeah. gathered on you if the, the military was in the area. Yeah, exactly. So that's where it's a bit of a, um, perhaps it's an oxymoron to think that you can have voluntary consent in any intelligence gathering whatsoever because, as you said, it's um, it. Um, but some would say that anthropology shouldn't be it. It should be purely scientific. It should be purely um, theoretical. It should be you know, capital T truth. It depends on, on the perspective that you take. But it's interesting, actually, back in the 40s, I think it was. Actually, no, in 1919, 
Franz Boas, he's the sort of the father of US anthropology. And he was quite concerned that he'd come across some evidence, uh, as he saw it, that there were four anthropologists who were using their professional identity, their professional position, as a cover for espionage. Uh, at least that was the accusation that Franz Boas uh, made. And what was really interesting was he, he took this to the American Anthropological Association's um, annual conference and decided to out these people. Um, and he was censured for attempting to, whether it was besmirch the reputation of anthropology, whether it was endanger the lives of these particular anthropologists that, you know, were now um, literally 100 years later, so it's hard to, to tell the facts of the matter. But the, the sense seems to be that there was a, a concern that by him outing these anthropologists, not only was he endangering their lives and their work, but the lives of the many other anthropologists who were working in yeah, in roles that could be accused of being espionage. So there was quite a lot of um, tumult over that at the time. Um, and then about 15, 20 years later, one of his um, uh, students and then now leading name in anthropology is um, Evans Pritchard. And he said that the use of anthropology in towards military effect was disastrous, a deplorable state of affairs. So you can see then when, back in the early 2000s, when the American Anthropological Association picks it up again, it, it's not surprising that they were concerned about that. But I think this then comes back to the idea that this notion that anthropology is a science and therefore can have capital T truth and, you know, capital O objective rigour. And I would argue that it's, it's more art than science. And as a result, um, do we need to be worried about the same sorts of, of obligations that the scientific community are under when they do research. Um, having said that, I'm still a fan of, of voluntary consent when I do an interview at least. It's quite interesting because the other field that I, I work and study in is uh, military medicine and we talk about civilian medicine, talk about informed consent or what you would do in the, like an ambulance mm -hmm. to save a person's life is very restricted and if you wanted to a new medication or a new technique, it would take decades to study that, but mm. you put that same technique or idea into a, a combat environment and say, well, we can try it outside the United States where maybe the, the laws are more relaxed or rules are more, you know, do your best to save a life and we're not going to worry so much about the legality. You see a mm. lot of incredible technology and techniques coming out of military medicine that then quickly gets absorbed by the rest of the civilian community because they haven't been able to, to study certain things. So I think there's always going to be that tension between trying to be honest, trying to search for truth, trying to be protective of individuals, and then that kind of more dangerous side of science to say, well, why don't we try it and, you know, advance the science without yeah. a limit, but then there's also other major kind of moral consequences uh, in that yeah. regard. Are there books or theories that you recommend that every soldier read or know, and do you have a, any special recommendations for uh, specific military ranks or assignments? It is a big question, yes. isn't it? Um, and I do, I actually wrote a, um, like a book uh, recommendation um, recently, I can send you the link for it, uh, with the, the um, army leader here in the UK, okay. uh, is one of the leading voices in PME, and he went to uh, a series of um, key figures in the, the PME world and the, in the military world, and then he ran out of talk, people to talk to and said, oh, Heather, could you, could you help me out here? So I, I put together a, um, a short kind of like a, a book recommendation but I'm, I'm always really loath to recommend books, mostly because I, I, I and you'll see when you uh, find the, the article, I am very conscious that anthropology sounds like this like exotic, very intelligent discipline that kind of lives out there where all the exotic culture lives. And, and when people do ask me for book recommendations, they quickly caveat it with, oh, but, you know, a book that I can read. Not, not like a fancy book like you would read. And it always kind of makes my heart sink just a little bit because it, it, it reinforces this idea that, that there are sort of levels of, of cultural knowledge. 
I often prefer to focus on developing cultural skills and, and doing that through quite easily actionable, almost, I, I consider them like icons, not so much concepts, the concepts are behind the icons. Um, one of my favourite slides, if I had only one slide to put up for a, a session that I was teaching, whether it was a you know, five minute session or, or a, a full day session, would be just literally one slide and it has three pictures on it. And they are pictures of spectacles, phones, a cup of tea, and a chessboard. Because I like to think of culture um, in these very sort of accessible concepts that you can then, when you're in the midst of quite a complex cross-cultural encounter, cross-cultural reality challenge, how many of us are going to pull out some really great obscure definition of what culture is or, you know, the, the um, five dimensions of culture or the 17 dimensions of cross-cultural variation, whatever it might be. I think cultural training tends to, well, it falls into two camps. It, it talks about either sort of the series of do's and don'ts that you should be, be thinking of, you know, make sure, remember, left hand, right hand, don't show the soles of your feet, don't talk about the, you know, the family too much, but do show an interest. And you can end up being paralysed by a long list of, or oh, hang on, this culture is going to have these value systems, so I must remember not to pat the child on the head, you know, whatever it might be. And that just, that's essentially giving people straitjackets before they're heading into very complicated environments. Um, I prefer to focus on the do's. If we're going to do do's and don'ts, focus on the do's. And I prefer to focus on these simple, actionable concepts, these icons. So if we've got a, a couple of minutes, I can run you through what those, yes, those three dimensions are. And yes, I do have book recommendations I can give you, so I'll give you that as well. But uh, when I talk about culture as a frame, I literally do mean these frames. And the fact that you and I are both wearing spectacles means that we're very familiar with what glasses do, which is that they help us see. You know, they help us perceive the reality that's in front of us. They, they turn objects into clarity, into something that's, that's objective, clear, actionable, factual, you know, capital T truth. And what they do then is in clarifying certain realities, they also obscure certain other realities, certain things that we, we simply, maybe we see, but kind of in through, through a glass dimly, perhaps they're, they're just a little bit blurry, or perhaps our glasses are literally like blinkers and they simply don't exist. These other realities don't exist. So culture then in that way clarifies certain realities, but obscures others. The great thing about recognising culture as a frame is that I can take my spectacles off and I can give them to you and you can look through my frames. Mm. And to be honest, I'll probably make you feel quite sick to start with because I have a different prescription to you, etc. Um, but even that, that element of, of you know, physical reaction to the frames of another is an example of how we are in culture beings of how we respond to our environment through these things that make everything feel steady, calm, the way it should be. But when we're encountering something that's complex where we suddenly come up against the boundaries of these frames, we can then look around us and go, who else has some, who else has some specs here I can borrow? And we can start trying to collectively look at the issue to try and identify what might be going on or different perspectives on what might be going on. So that's frames. Um, then I talk about, and apologies to those of you who like alphabetical order because I then skip from F to H and come back to games. But habits is, I'm, I'm literally talking about um, the, the habits that make us feel comfortable in our daily life. That culture is a series of, of habits that make us feel like we belong, feel like we're at home, feel like we're where we should be in life. Again, that sort of stable dimension. And the great thing about those habits is that um, they, they do make us feel at home, they make us feel comfortable. Uh, and that the cup of tea is my perfect example of it because, you know, I, I like to... I, I have now realised I live my life according to a, a schedule of tea. <laughs> I didn't realise that until a few years ago when I was trying to think through these sort of fairly simple concepts for thinking about culture. 
But I have quite a, a sort of a strict ritual of uh, or regime of, of teas through the day. And when I don't have that tea, I'm out of sorts. You know, it, it's not a matter of the caffeine necessarily. I can't just swap to a cup of coffee and, and be good to go. It needs to be tea. It must have milk in it, no sugar. It, there are certain things that if I don't have it at the right time, my day just doesn't feel right. And so culture then is a series of those habits that make us feel right, feel like things are as they should be. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, complex theory behind it. Uh, there's one of my favourite anthropologists uh, is Pierre Bourdieu, and he came up with, or he expanded on Aristotle's notion of habitus to, to look at cultural profiles basically as being the sum of all our habits, sum of all the things that we don't even think about, that just instinctively we respond to pre-conscious dispositions to act in certain ways. And again, bringing to bear that concept of frames, it means that by choosing some habits and, and being encultured into some habit profiles or habits, uh, we then subconsciously and sometimes actively exclude ourselves from other forms of habits, from other habitus, other possible futures. So that those futures become perhaps difficult for us or unlikely, or simply just they don't exist. You know, it hasn't occurred to us that that was a possible future. Oh, and then lastly, I talk about culture as a series of games. And this is back to the chessboard imagery. And I find that some people really respond to the simplicity of the frames because you know they see specs all around. Some people respond to the habitus and the sense that your body literally can feel out of place because the body is an excellent tuning fork for cultural understanding or for reading culture, if we learn how to listen to the body, that is. And then others really enjoy the, the notion of the game because culture is essentially a series of social encounters, a series of social spaces in which we're employing the various capital that I talked about before, the various um, forms of power, to pursue our objectives, to pursue our, our mission. And, you know, obviously in a military context, we've got our, our military mission, but at an interpersonal context, we all have objectives for what we're seeking to achieve in any given social encounter. And I'd argue even altruistic social encounters are still driven by a sense that it makes us feel good to be nice to others. It makes me feel like Heather if I, you know, offer somebody else a cup of tea. And as a result... We're employing our various forms of capital to try and negotiate and compete in these games, in these cultural spaces. And if we can recognise, first of all, that the game exists, we can then choose to enter it. And when we're thinking at a, at a national security or, or at a strategic level, to try and understand global political uh, order, we need to understand the games that are being played, you know, what the, the key players are seeking to achieve. But even at an interpersonal level, when somebody's trying to get attention to order a coffee at a coffee shop, they're also playing a game. They're also employing their capital to achieve an objective. And they have to, first of all, identify the game they're trying to play, but then second, identify who the other players are in the game. Who else is competing for the barista's attention? What capital do I have that I can get a bit more attention from the barista than the other guy? Might be Q capital here in the in the UK. Q capital is very important. Standing in the queue for the prescribed amount of time, knowing your place um, in the queue and your place relative to the other players. And so we might try and negotiate our way around that uh, encounter. We might try and sort of skip around the queue to employ a different type of capital. But the game is structured by the rules that the players agree on. So whilst it won't necessarily be objectively stated, very seldom is uh, cultural games objectively stated as to what the rules are. Those rules are always in negotiation by the various players of the game. So A, we need to find out, does the game exist? B, we need to find out who are the other players? C, how can I leverage my capital in order to compete more effectively in this game. And then ultimately, how do we know when the game's been won? Yeah. How do we know that it's it's over? Coffee shop, very straightforward. I had my coffee, good. I don't think they spat in it, good to go. 
National security, much more difficult. Uh, international relations, much more difficult to know. And that's why it's key that we accurately identify the game that's being played at the outset and continue to be alert to the fact that the game may well have morphed into multiple other games depending on the players that have now come into it and their relative position in that game. So that's a very long-winded way of saying uh, there are a lot of complex theories out there and if you want, I'd be delighted to give you details on Pierre Bourdieu and his very obscure practice theory and the theory of capital. I'm a mad Bourdieuian fan, but practically speaking, I think it's quite helpful to have these very actionable icons in the back of our mind where we can remember that image of the spectacles or remember the image of the cup of tea or the board game and then employ that in the heat of the moment, so to speak. Because I think that what well, research has shown that when it comes to cultural intelligence, you know, the ability to be effective in a wide variety of cross-cultural encounters, it's not about the knowledge, it's not about the, you know, the do's and don'ts or the 101 points that point us to understanding Iraqi culture. It's not even about doing the cross-cultural encounter. It's not just about being able to adjust your body language and your pace of speech and your vocabulary. It's actually about the, the sense of motivation. It's about the sense of self-efficacy, that I can do this dimension and I want to do this because it's fun, you know, I'm good at it, it's going to enhance my career, whatever it may be. But out of the, the four dimensions of the CQ construct, the fourth one being the ability to plan for a cross-cultural encounter, it's motivation, it's the, the, the you know, self-efficacy that really is the powerhouse of culturally intelligent behaviour. And so I'm in the process of trying to shift um, cultural training, at least for these strange principles, away from the, the do's and don'ts, which are very essential, into the I can do this space. I, we are all already cultural experts. You, know, you, you are fluent in your subcultural norms. It's about learning how to employ that fluency in a culturally unfamiliar environment. So if we can build on that sense of self-efficacy and, and um, confidence, then there's no reason why we can't adapt to the next cultural environment. I really like yeah. the analogies. I particularly like the analogy of the game. And yeah, I, the thing, thought you would. The thing that came to my mind was actually like the difference between like American football and then football or whether you call it soccer and then rugby where <laughs> you have like various different cultures all have a very, they're very similar constructs of games and it's, if you take an American football player and drop them down on the soccer field, it's that, it's like how quickly can you, can you let go of the game of Ameri the rules of American football? How, how fast can you pick up the kind of concepts of, a, of soccer? But mm. then it kind of goes one step farther to say, like, when do you stop thinking like an American football player? And when you start thinking like a soccer player, that's when you can really try to really maneuver on the field. So it's yeah. uh, it's uh, And some of that is, like, understanding the rules of the culture that really would be difficult to give out in the list saying, you know, hey, yeah. don't do this. It's the it's the things that children learn that aren't very well communicated or just kind of that knowledge mm -hmm. of what to do when and how to pick up on the kind of the hidden rules of the society. Exactly. And that's why culture is really in the doing. So that's why Pierre Bourdieu described it as practice theory. It's you know, it is in the praxis, but it's in the doing of culture that culture literally gets constructed and it's only in the doing that we can start to learn about it. So this is the challenge of focusing, yeah, on, on the sort of the, the lists because the most important stuff is never in a list. Having said that though, I did promise to give you some um, book references uh, and for those that uh, are interested, I can send you uh, more details about Pierre Bourdieu, but his outline of the theory of practice is where he talks about um, practice theory. His book called Distinction is where he digs into the notion of difference and how we distinguish ourselves from others. Okay. But both of those, in the first instance, I'd suggest perhaps Wikipedia it because his, his uh, language style is very French, but he is a Frenchman or was a Frenchman, and very obscure. So it, for those that like a, um, a real 
challenge, and I'll enjoy it and we'll do it. And just give yourself a whole weekend to read a chapter, and, and that's sort of the speed at which you typically take these things. For those that are looking for something that's sort of more practically oriented, um, I've got two recommendations. Uh, one of them is the, the book that I recommended uh, through the, the Army Leader um, Summer Book Reading List, and that's um, Leading with Cultural Intelligence by David Livermore. And he is looking at that notion of CQ that I mentioned before, cultural intelligence. And CQ is perhaps seen as sort of the next step of EQ. You know, we know we've got IQ, intelligence quotient, EQ being emotional intelligence, and now CQ. And, and CQ is quite similar in many ways to EQ, but it's the ability to employ your skills at reading others and your ability to manage and moderate your own behaviour in order to successfully influence others, but in a culturally unfamiliar environment. And so he has, in that book he talks uh, more about the CQ construct um, and those four dimensions of, of CQ drive being the most important, CQ knowledge being the, the do's and don'ts, but also how culture works, you know, how does power get constructed, uh, how is identity formed, etc. CQ strategy, the ability to plan for and actively moderate your, your behaviour and intentions during a cross-cultural encounter. And then the, the CQ action, the ability to put it into practice and actively um, change your behaviour to suit the environment. And what he does is he puts it within the context of leadership. So what does a culturally intelligent leader need to think about? Uh, and within the military, we recognise that we're all leaders. So it's a, a quite an accessible and, and, and practically oriented book, but quite a useful book, I think, for those that are wanting to think about how to get better at doing leadership within a cross-cultural environment, recognising that every unit will have a cross-cultural dimension to it, even at home, because there'll be gender distinctions, there'll be age distinctions, there'll be perhaps ethnic and religious distinctions, There'll be regional distinctions, perhaps even, and each of those then shape the value systems that we bring to the party. Uh, and then last, talking about different regions, um, Tim Marshall's Prisoners of Geography, uh, can you see that there, yeah, okay. is a book that is, is quite, um, quite an easy read, but quite an interesting read as well, because what he does is he highlights uh, the impact of geography of literal physical terrain on how a nation come to see themselves the way they are, how they come to, to make decisions about their identity and their place in the world and their relationships with those around them. So it's not typically a cultural book, but to me, culture is fundamentally shaped by the geographic features of the environment in which the culture operates. So those are three good books. And for anyone that wants to learn more about military anthropology, there's the book by Montgomery with Fate. And what she does there is she unpacks through a series of kind of vignettes based around uh, little-known anthropologists. You know, she doesn't go straight to the Pierre Bourdieu's or the Franz Boas um, stories, but she goes to the less-known anthropologists and talks about how their insights have helped uh, further um, military objectives or indeed perhaps how uh, if they have failed as well. So it's quite a good book for thinking through things like what can anthropology tell us about leadership and the ability to, um, you know, gather and, and garner the, the support of a, a loose coalition of, of partners. Um, so definitely recommend that. Everything from, yes, the, the practical do's and don'ts in the David Livermore book through to the very obscure but quite fascinating Pierre Bourdieu. Okay. Well, for the audience out there that wants to see kind of more of your work, uh, do you have any social media that we can follow you on or websites or anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, and no doubt you'll pop this up in a little text box at some point for us. But uh, my, my Twitter handle is um, something that I thought about well before I ever thought I was going to have an actual profile. So it's at Skousk, which is not a very useful uh, handle by any means, but S-K-O-U-S-G being my name, Heather Skousgaard, but short enough that you can fit it into the um, character set that we're all limited to. Well, I've also got, you'll see there, um, in due course, I'll be making some links to some of the articles that I'm doing for the Australian Defence Force. Okay. Uh, we have
have a, a curated uh, online hub for joint PME, joint professional military education, and that's part of a, a new initiative that was launched late last year of a JPMA strategy that's looking at building key skills and behaviours from ab initio training right through to senior SERs and senior NCOs. And excitingly, one of those dimensions now is cultural intelligence. So under the, the um, key learning area of, of leadership and ethics, we now have cultural intelligence as a dimension that every member of the ADF, as I said, at the officer and NCO level and in due course across all ranks, is expected to both build, maintain and grow their cultural intelligence over the course of their career. So my task on Return to Canberra in about a month's time is to figure out how I can translate all of these great ideas that I've been soaking in here at the Defence Academy into a, an actionable and flexible uh, learning program okay. for the Australian Defence Force of Cultural Intelligence. And now is that resource the Forge or is that something it else? It is indeed, yeah, okay. the Forge. So you'll pop that up on the, the yes. screen as well, no doubt. But there's a whole series of different leadership um, resources there as well as, you know, tech and capability and um, you'll, you'll see the military strategy, national security and decision making. But the one that you'll see my name associated with is going to be more in the leadership and culture space. Okay. Well, I thank you very much for taking the time to be here with today. I, I, I personally have questions. I could talk to you for several hours. Oh, on some really? So I, I look forward to seeing more of your work and seeing what you have the the bring and I, I might be pinging you with questions on Twitter every once in a while. With. That sounds perfect. I look forward to it. For the audience out there, thank you uh, for watching this uh, episode. I invite you to subscribe to the Evolving Warfighter for more videos on the topic of military self-development and military history. And until next time, focus on your self-development so we can ensure that we can dominate the modern battlefield. Thank you.